Hello everyone, welcome to the third virtual student conference. Um, this is organized by members of the European and Eurasian uh, Regional Advisory Committees. Um, today we have uh, three sessions with each of them, uh, three or four uh, speakers. Um, they will give a 10 minutes talk, after which we have uh, five minutes uh, of uh, questions. Um, the, the student conference will be recorded and will be uploaded to the, um, the SEG website and YouTube, the SEG YouTube channel. And uh, I think we can start now. So I would like to pass this over to uh, the first session chairs, uh, Roberto and Mariana. Hey, thank you, Yono, and good evening, everyone. So, as uh, as Yono said, me and Mariana are going to host the first session, which is a uh, hazard assessment. And I guess we can already start with uh, Julia Alessandrini, who is going to speak about seismic cell classification, the importance of the geophysical characterization. Yes. Thank you. And um, can you see me? Can you hear me? It's fine. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So I will share my screen. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. I am Giulia Alessandrini and I will talk about the importance of the geophysical characterization in uh, seismic soil classification. One of the most important steps in a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis is the definition of the ground motion prediction equations, equation used to predict the acceleration of an earthquake at a site of interest. Since the first attempts in defining these ground motion prediction equations, the scientific community has been trying to take into account the site effect in terms of a seismic soil classification. In fact, the amplification of seismic waves can take place when different types of soils are located above the seismic bedrock. This is the reason why in our work we decided to characterize 10 accelerometric stations in uh, southern Italy in uh, the region of Irpinia. This is part of a larger probabilistic seismic hazard analysis focused on two dams in this area. In particular, the main goal is to find site-specific attenuation laws, and this requires a reassessment of the seismic station site classification. We decided to characterize these 10 stations because of the proximity of the two dams, and also because of the number of the useful earthquakes recorded by these stations. So my talk uh, will follow these steps. First, an introduction to OS30. Then I bri briefly show how do we estimate OS30. We'll discuss about the difference between three measurement methods with our case study, and then we'll get to the conclusions. OS30 is the equivalent uh, seismic shear wave velocity from the surface to a depth of 30 meters. In Italy, since 2018, West 30 has been replaced by West equivalent, that is the equivalent seismic shear wave velocity from the surface to the bedrock. And if the bedrock is deeper than 30 meters, then West equivalent is calculated like West 30. So usually uh, seismic soil classification provides five site classes based on West 30. Here in this table, we can see the five site classes from A to E um, identified for decreasing values of VS equivalent according to the Italian building code. So how do we estimate VS30? It should be clearly measured by one of the many available geophysical technique, but these are expensive and sometimes uh, they require, fi require fieldwork. So sometimes researchers prefer 
faster and cheaper methods to estimate this parameter. For example, in the Italian databases, uh, WS30 is sometimes estimated through two methods that are the surface geology method that correlates sites with similar lithology, geomorphology, and phages with site-specific investigation. So basically from large-scale geological maps. Here we have an example from our case study. This is the Ascoli Satriano Accelerometric Station. From surface geology, uh, we can see that this station is located on shallow conglomerates and this corresponds to an A site classification. Usually in the databases, uh, these site classes are marked by a star because they are estimated and not directly measured. Another proxy to West 30 is the topographic method, which correlates sites with similar ranges of topographic slope with site-specific investigation for the rugged in West 30. It is found, by the way, that um, this method sometimes do, do not match with the geographical, uh, geological method. In fact, the same accelerometric station corresponds now to a B site class from topography. So the last and probably only way to measure West 3D is through geophysics. And here we'll refer in particular to the joint fit of two types of measurement that are the active and passive multi-channel analysis of surface waves from which we obtain the dispersion curves, so the MASB and REMI technique, and the passive technique, which records ambient noise vibration at one single station from which we obtain the HV curve. From the joint fit of this type of measurement, we obtain the average West model profile for the site. So for the case of the Ascoli Satriano accelerometric station, here is the West profile model. And the West equivalent has to be calculated like West 30 because the bedrock here is very, very deep. So the West equivalent, so the West 30 is 280 meters per second. And according to the Italian building code, this corresponds to a C site class. So as, as we can see in this summary, the geophysical characterization for this station is completely different from what expected from the surface geology and the topography. And both these methods overestimated the site category for this, for this station. And the results of the other 10 surveyed accelerometric stations are summarized in this table. First, let's compare the surface geology and the geophysical characterization. 60% of these surveyed stations have a different class from what, from what expected from the surface geology. And in all cases, the surface geology overestimated the site category. So the surface geology provides stiffer stoop soil classes. While for what concerns the topography, the 50% match and the 50% mismatch, and lastly, the surface geology and the topographic model, they, um, the 60% of the site classes are different. So these two methods seem unable to replace the geophysical characterization and also they show evident, evident discrepancies between them. So here are the surveyed accelerometric stations in white and the two dams for which we are carrying out this study. And if we look at all the useful accelerometric stations for our work, we can notice that only a very minor part, only the 30%, is located in sites where a geophysical characterization has been carried out, while the 70% in red have an unsurveyed accelerometric station site. So in conclusion, the discrepancy between estimated and measured site classes is evident. The surface geology and topographic methods are not sufficiently accurate to replace the field measurements. The fact that only few stations have a geophysically assessed West 30 turns to have relevant consequences on the attenuation laws for our study and more generally on modern ground motion prediction equations, which all take site effects into account. And a further ambiguity arises since the regulations have changed from 2018 in Italy. 
the West equivalent A class is now different from the West 30 A class. In the Italian reference databases, we found that the locations of the seismic station are still classified according to West 30. An update is therefore necessary. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Julia. So we forgot to mention earlier that if you want to make questions, uh, you can write down them like in the Q&A section. And in the meantime, are there any questions right now from some of you? I will ask a question. Yep. Um, about uh, classification, mm -hmm. as I understand you have A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And um, what would be the, the problem if you misclassify uh, some of the soil? For example, yeah. what, what would be the, be the problem if you classify an A soil as a C soil? Yeah, I can show you here. Okay, so um, my goal is to create new ground motion prediction equations. So I want to make a law in which I can see how the acceleration of an earthquake um, decays with distance. So here again, we have the Ascoli Satriano case. This station was classified as A from surface geology. This means that uh, you think that this data is on bedrock, is recorded on bedrock. So you think that there is no amplification, there is no side effect. You think that date data is pure, you can say. But now we know after we measured that station that there's a lot of amplification in this acceleration data. So we need to correct for the correct uh, side effect. And so here we, you can both overestimate or underestimate the acceleration data. So uh, you, you build wrong ground motion prediction equations. And so the final consequence is that you have a wrong uh, seismic hazard model. So it's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of consequences in uh, bad characterized site classification, site classes. Oh, I see. thank you. Thanks. All right, um, I have a question for you actually. Mm -hmm. um, will this data be available after your project is done uh, for the uh, seismic risk characterization of Italy? So will this data be available for like, for example, the environment um, minister or something for, uh, for public use? Okay. Uh, yes or no. I mean, I will mm, give my results to the institutions. Uh, but they are not going to update the Italian seismic hazard map, I can say, because um, my goal is to give to the institutions some response spectra for different return periods. And this is kind of um, a normal procedure for large buildings. So every number of years, uh, they need to have this uh, new data for like post earthquakes monitorings, post earthquakes checks. So I'm not going to contribute to the, to the Italian map, but they are, um, they are creating now a new hazard map for Italy. So maybe it will be uh, interesting to compare my results with the, the new hazard map that is going to, to be updated in a few months, I think. Thank you. All right, is there any other question from the audience? If not, I guess that we can go on. Okay. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you to you. And so uh, we continue with Basiliki Rosopoulou. I hope I pronounced well the name. Uh, yes, you pronounced well. <laughs> okay, uh, let me do it. So can you see all of you my screen? Yes, you can okay. see. Okay, 
So uh, my name is Vasiliki Visopoulou. Uh, welcome to my presentation about the integrated geomechanic study of uh, in situ stress uh, and fracture system in the Pedretto underground lab inside from a tripod of boreholes. Uh, here I, I will say a few words about the introduction, uh, the research uh, site description, uh, the uh, main in situ stress conditions that are relevant to this site, um, some words about the hydrofracture analysis and uh, the conclusions uh, from this research. So, uh, deep geothermal energy is subdivided into hydrothermal and into a cello and deep geothermal energy. The deep geothermal energy actually consists of hydrothermal system and enhanced geothermal systems. Our focus it lies on the enhanced geothermal system since Swiss government decided to eliminate the nuclear energy for electricity production, but instead focuses on the ge geothermal energy. Uh, for that reason, uh, the main concept of this system uh, is summarized into three main steps. The first one is the reservoir creation, uh, since um, the technology for this system is still in progress. Actually, uh, the geothermal in Switzerland is, uh, is very low uh, and for that reason uh, during uh, reservoir creation hydraulic simulation experiments are essential but rock slip may occur into the pre-existing fractures and uh, uh, produces some micro seismic events known as induced seismicity. For that reason the enhanced geothermal system systems are not always safe and uh, our main concern is just to avoid uh, non-hazardous uh, seismic events during the fluid injection. The other step uh, is to have um, to manage to have continuous fluid flow into the reservoir in order to um, which, which is associated uh, with the hydraulic linkage between the boreholes uh, and um, in order to create a heat exchanger. For that reason, uh, ETH Zurich and uh, Swiss uh, Combined Center for Energy Research um, established the Bedretto Underground Laboratory for Geosciences, uh, known as BALC as well. In addition to the uh, ex existing Grimm Society, as you can see here or in the map. A few words about the geology of the Bedretto Tunnel, uh, which has an orientation of southeast northwest. As you can see here in the first 500 uh, uh, tunnel meter uh, is composed by schist, while the other 500 to 1,400 uh, tunnel meters um, is uh, nice. And uh, the Bedretto laboratory uh, is located into the homogeneous rotondo granite, which is very important uh, since it resembles the geology of the crust of the Switzerland uh, in um, of five kilometers deep. Uh, there above the bulk, uh, you can see that there is an overburden of approximately one kilometer. And uh, based on some preliminary stress analysis, we figure out that the uh, stress regime is normal strike uh, slip folding regime. So during the borehole campaign, uh, six Six boreholes were drilled in the first experimental phase with a diameter of 101 millimeter. And uh, our focus is going to be only on those three SB boreholes. The SB 2.1 borehole uh, is a vertical borehole with a length of 30 meters, while the other two, SB 2.2 and SB 2.3, are inclined boreholes with a 60 degrees inclination and the 70 and 70 degrees um, inclination there correspondingly with a length of 40 meters. Um, of course, uh, based on these uh, boreholes, we want to identify the fractures because fractures have a significant impact on the mechanical behavior of the rock mass as they provide rock stiffness of the intact medium and change the in-situ stress. For that reason, we used uh, uh, four different tools, uh, uh, tool images, in order to identify them. Uh, the core scan images, as you can see also here in the picture, the core log images, the acoustic televiewer log images, and the uh, OTV images. The ATV log uh, consists of a rotating transducer that emits ultra ultrasonic pulse 
through the Borho wall, and then the signal uh, that's reflecting from the Borho wall is detected from the receiver. And then the amplitude and the travel time are recorded. On the other hand, the OTV log uh, consists of uh, a CCD camera and a reflector, and actually focuses on a 360 degree slice of the Borho wall. You can see here that there are fractures that they are visible in the uh, core log images and the ATV log images, but not in the other two images. But our main focus uh, is going to be in the syncytial curves of the ATV logs. All of these tools provide quantitative and qualitative information about the fractures. Uh, based on the picking of the fracture from the ATV log, we classified the fractures into four main fracture sets. But in our case, only two main sets are appeared. The red one, which is uh, represent as the north striking striking fractures, and the purple ones, that is two not parallel fractures. The uh, green um, spots here, as you can see, uh, represent the mini frac intervals. Based on a preliminary in situ stress analysis, we found out that the vertical stress is around 26.5 megapascal. The maximum horizontal stress is around 23.85 megapascal, while the, the minimum horizontal stress is 15.2 megapascal and the pore pressure range is between 3 to 6 megapascal. All of these stress components indicate a stress regime that is normal to strike faulting regime. On, however, the general trend of the SH max is north 100 east, which is the estimated azimuth. But um, before uh, the hydraulic simulation experiment is very essential to characterize the rock mass. For that reason, we compared the densities based on the uh, MSCL um, and LAV measurements. As you can see here, the density profiles of the SB2.1 and SB2. 0.3 boreholes indicate a density of 2.62 gram per cubic centimeters, which is very logical for the granitic rock mass of the bulk. Here you also can observe some artifacts, and uh, this is due to the fact that uh, the density needs to calibrate with a core identical material and not with plastic or iron as the um, uh, uh, constructors of the MSCL uh, uh, tool suggested. Uh, based on the density that we found down and the semblance P wave and S wave velocities, uh, we uh, derived the elastic modulus, um, which actually measures the uh, object resistant to elastic deformation when the stress is applied. And here are the main components of the elastic modulus. It's the Young modulus, uh, which is uh, actually um, represent the stiffness of the material. The larger the Young modulus, uh, the larger the stress for the deformation. The bulk, here is the bulk modulus, which is the module of incompressibility, while the shear modulus uh, is referred as the module of re re rigidity and uh, shows us how resistant is the material in the uh, searing deformation. And the Poisson ratio, uh, that uh, uh, actually represent the measure of compressibility, while the materia expands, uh, tends to expand perpendicular uh, to the direction of the compression. Of course, um, it was very important to design the, the propagation uh, of the hydrofracture. For that reason, the geometry of the hydrofracture was based on a simple formula uh, based on the injected volume, uh, the width, of the uh, hydrofracture plane and the height. Of course, the injected volume uh, arranges uh, in on its test interval with its borehole, uh, but the width uh, was uh, either 0.5 or 1, uh, was assumed as 0.5 or 1 millimeter, while the height was assumed as the test interval, which was 0.7 meters. Uh, usually, the hydrofracture propagate along the maximum horizontal uh, stress direction or uh, in perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress direction. But in our case, uh, the hydrofracture were propagated along the SH max direction. And here you can see the two scenarios. The first uh, scenario here in the left, and si left uh, side um, is with a width of one millimeter. Uh, you can see, of course, that the hydrofractures here propagate 
less than the hydro fracture here with uh, a smaller width with a 0.5 millimeters. And uh, the conclusion is that the, the smaller the width, the longer the hydro fractures. As it can be seen in both figures, the hydro fractures can likely intersect with the natural fractures. And this is very important because possible uh, uh, leak off will take place into the natural fractures and uh, with uh, the critical pressure can contribute to reactivate these fractures. Uh, the conclusion of this research is that the fracture identification is essential for this in situ stress analysis and the hydraulic simulation experiments. The estimated density and the P-wave velocity uh, that it was around uh, 5,000 uh, uh, meters per second are reasonable for the uh, granitic rock mass of the tunnel. The elastic modulus gives a better estimation of the granitic rock properties. And uh, in both scenarios, the hydrofractures seem to intersect with natural fractures. Also, the estimated minimum horizontal stress from the hydrofracture analysis doesn't fit completely with the preliminary in situ stress estimations. Thank you for your attention and what's my presentation. Thank you very much. So, uh, any question from the audience? Should I stop sharing my screen or? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Unless you don't want to show some image for images from the for the yeah. answers. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, this was a really interesting project. Uh, this was this is a really interesting project, and actually, yeah. I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, what is the range uh, in which you consider uh, valid the petrophysical properties that you analyzed uh, for this formation for this granitic formation? I mean, in mean sense that, yeah. of distance from the from the boreholes. Uh, you mean, I mean, the, the boreholes uh, have um, had a, a, a diameter of 101 millimeter. Uh, so we did, uh, we did some uh, rock, uh, rock mass estimation from the cores that, uh, we, that they were drilled. So you mean uh, the distance? Uh, yeah, just the, uh, just the curiosity about how uh, how do you upscale maybe the, the property that you analyzed? Uh, you mean about the density in the P wave velocity? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so uh, the density profiles that you can see over there uh, were analyzed uh, over uh, one meter of uh, its core. Uh, so then um, uh, these cores uh, were analyzed in a multi-sensor core logging tool uh, that has uh, that has different sensors, and one of them was the density uh, and the P wave uh, velocity, and the other one was the lab measurements. Uh, that also uh, we um, uh, we took some samples of the core uh, and then testified in order to see if uh, these both uh, measurements can uh, uh, have the same uh, result for a granitic mass. And of course, um, these values are consistent with the granitic mass. Uh, I don't know if I have the figure over there. Um, maybe I can show you another figure, but just a moment in order to see. Yeah. Okay. I will share again my screen. So maybe you can see here that these, um, these, um, uh, the velocity and uh, the density are pretty reasonable for this granitic rock mass because based on the naphed ray curve here, as you can see, we have the uh, values that we also identified in, uh, based on, the, on this uh, measurement, the MSCL and the lab measurements. So, okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. We can move on and, and I would like to uh, pass the lead to Mariana. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Roberto. So next, uh, we are going to have uh, Marcus Bassler. I hope I said it correctly, from Freie Universität Berlin. And Marcus is going to talk about uh, mitigating landslide hazards in Scandinavia, a 9C seismic array case study. So, Marcus, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and, and start. Um, I think I already am. Can you see what I'm showing? Yes, perfect. I think everyone can see. Great. Um, so yeah, hello and welcome. Um, I'm here to tell you about a joint field study between the University of Uppsala and Free University Berlin to characterize quick clay deposits, to give a short overview of the research topic and what we've done. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Marcus Besler, a master degree student with focus on mineralogy and petrology from Berlin. But first, I'd like to thank the SEG for making all that possible. I will mostly talk things through in chronological order, starting with the inception of the idea at the IGSC 2019, hosted by the SEG student chapter Uppsala, where during mingling, Professor Dr. Ali Reza Malami, the expert on the topic, uh, proposed the idea of a joint field camp. And um, we were happy to agree. And um, we, in that case, um, are the SEG student chapter Berlin. Um, we are a summit chapter with members coming from many different backgrounds and specializations like tectonics, well, me with mineralogy, petrology, ground mechanics, geography, and so forth. We're based at the Free University and our next project will be visiting a terminal storage facility. Um, only those four in the picture took part from left to right, Marlene, Robert, Benedict, and me, Marcus on the left. Um, together with Uppsala, we worked on conceptualizing the compelling proposal that thankfully got approved. Um, we originally intended to use a BGK7 borehole geophone um, with an easily accessible borehole I will talk later about, but uh, that was sadly removed, that the access got destroyed by the farmer during field work. So uh, our initial idea was rendered impossible. Um, then also due to Corona, we had a lot of complications like um, we had to rework the risk matrix, conceptualize hygiene concepts um, and find a fitting date for our field camp, uh, which we, of course, thankfully were successful with. Our goal was to characterize, as I already mentioned, the quick clay deposits or rather the geophysical parameters of those layers. Um, with that gain knowledge, we hope to ultimately help to assess the likelihood of landslides occurring in those areas and developing sufficient protective measurements. Um, we were there and used multiple methods like TTAM, geomagnetics, geoelectricity, electricity, gravimetry, magnetic susceptibility, and of course, seismics with which we hoped to um, and further narrow down the so far imprecise wave velocities for those quick lay layers. Um, we started with a short introduction into the methods, the tectonic sedimentary explanations, the significance of this research and the historical background. Um, we had an international crew um, with people from Uganda, Nigeria, Brazil, Greece, China, Hong Kong, and ironically not even one person from Sweden. Uh, we were on our way to the field site to Lilla Edet on the 28th, um, which lies in, use the laser pointer, in southwestern Sweden, near the river Jota. Um, visible in the close up is already the landslide scar, which is the reason for the initial focus on that location. Um, here's another close-up where you can see it even better. Um, the investigated area is in the Jutta River Valley. 
The quaternary deposits are mainly composed of glacial clays and uh, post-glacial silts. And the lowermost sequence of sediments consists of varved or laminated clays with layers of sand and silts, which often contain artesian water. And that is the problem, the, the root of the problem, because those quick clays are prone to liquefying, meaning quay, um, clay layers often build, or, or clay minerals, um, build tita and octahedrons, and those often are due to cation exchange, um, have a usually net negative layer charge that is balanced out by interlayer ions, which, but then due to groundwater flux and rain get leached out. So the repelling forces between the layers get stronger, resulting in an unstable microstructure, which then leads to that liquefying and landslides. Um, I keep talking about leaching out, but I want to point out that those also can occur in freshwater clay sediments. The most common assumption, though, is that those marine sediments, including marine clays, become exposed above sea level due to isostatic uplift from 10,000 years ago and today um, from the retreating of the ice shield. An example of those landslides would be the famous 57 landslide where a half um, paper mill slid into the river, which was a large local disaster because the milling chemicals poured in the water as well, polluting the groundwater for cattle farming and people. Or another example would be this landslide with, as you can see, large scale damage to the infrastructure. So we went there and measured. Uh, this is a line of the, uh, this is the view of the seismic line in northeast direction with uh, with a um, landslide scar somewhere behind there. So we used 269 geophones in increments of one meter, used an Elvis unit for sweet test and S-wave generation and hammering for S and P regeneration as well, but I will focus on the P-wave results, which you can see here. We can see easily visible reflections and refractions here as well. And here are some of the earlier results, um, the preliminary interpretation. Um, we processed the shot records and the refractions revealed three distinct layers. Um, while the two reflections show a delineation at a fourth layer, the so-called hidden layer in between, that often is undetected. God damn it, where can I turn off that pot? Whatever. Um, so yeah, another um, thing to point out is the unusually low wave velocity, which already implies that those layers are um, oversaturated with water, which then could cause definitely that leaching and therefore landsliding. Um, so with that outlook, we will be part of adding another piece to the puzzle of understanding these clays and landslide geohazards. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I will try to answer them at the best of my abilities. And if you have feedback, I'd love to hear that now and later or whenever. All, all right, thank you very much, Marcus. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, so I can now officially open the Q&A uh, session. Uh, so someone is asking here, uh, so Jonathan Doyoro, I think, mm -hmm. is asking, how do you know hidden layer? Um, I see that Jono wants to answer that as well. Um, from what I know so far, let's go back a bit, that those layers or that layer we could detect with the reflections, those reflections here. So um, we have the upper boundary and the lower boundary. And okay. um, with that, we have some... So with the bright way. reflectors, right? Yeah. 
Okay. I think. Um, I, 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 I mean, I tried. I mean, I think Jono can hopefully answer that better than me. Um, oh, I actually just. Is, yeah. Is to just, make sure is, you were. Yeah. It's just making sure that this question is going to be answered. So mm -hmm. um, it's just a, a question of logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we know that the, the question is, is answered. Uh, I actually have a question for you. I think I think that question was was properly answered, and I have a question for you. Uh, you're showing uh, here some seismic, and my question is: Did you have the necessity to process your seismic, uh, or do something to improve the quality, or remove noise, or whatever? Um, those were only preliminary results because okay. we. Um, I mean, we were given some of the data so far, um, and the others were rather busy with it as well. Um, I mean, that's what I could make of what we have as data as a non-geophysicist. Um, okay. But but there definitely will be more to hear, probably also here as well, because um, you know. Um, the SEG student Uppsala um, is like a powerhouse on that research subject and um, there definitely will be more to come in that regard. Yes, okay, perfect. So you still have uh, some some time to do it. Okay, Marcus, I don't know if there is any other question from the audience. Uh, if not... Uh, I, I, sorry, I do have... Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, Yes, uh, you said uh, there is like more data available, and I don't know if you said it already, and I uh, didn't uh, hear it. But was uh, there other because you said that for the seismic there was PNS wave uh, acquired? Mm. But was there another data acquired, another method that was used in the area? Yeah, yeah, um, we used uh, TTM geomagnetics, um, magnetic susceptibility. Um, let me just go back. Mm, let's see what I mentioned. I mean, I wasn't that already. I mean, we had like four, five, six. Uh, geomagnetics, TTM, geoelectricity. Yeah, that was it. Gravimetry and magnetic susceptibility. So, um, Talking about all of those in 10 minutes would have been a bit too much. Like uh, 10 minutes are too short for that. Um, and the next talk will be by Alex about the same site. Ah, okay. And yeah, on that regard, I wanted to know if uh, you were able, maybe not yet, because as you said, it's a work in progress, but if you were able to make comparison of the data that was acquired, like with the different methods to um, have... Um, like common conclusion or some similarities in the data. Mm. Uh, but I don't know if you have done that yet uh, or not. Um, I mean, from what I've seen so far, all is in line and the results were great. Like um, far higher um, um, resolution, for example. Exactly, but uh, you didn't compare yet the different results that you had with the different methods to see if there is some correlation in the results. Or... Um, I have not. Okay, great. No, I just wanted to know. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. A very interesting presentation. Good luck to your to your work. Thanks. Um, and now. We are going to have Alex Hobe from Uppsala University. Alex is going to talk about investigating subsurface quick clay and bedrock topography using ERT and TEM methods. So, uh, Alex, um, whenever you're ready, you can start. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, does everybody hear me? Yes. You can see my mouse as well. Yes. Um, as Marcus said, um, this is part of the same project that happened last month. And um, I was a part of um, 
organizing the IGSC in 2019. I was the manager for the scientific section, so I was really happy to see something like this coming out of it. Uh, my work focused on, on um, the characterization of geothermal sites. And at the same time, I was the field teacher for the ERT part of this particular field camp. So that is why I get to present this particular part. Um, as Marcus showed, quick clay landslides can have devastating effects. And when we look at this image here, um, quick clay landslides, uh, quick clays are part of glacial sediments. Um, as Marcus said, that uh, due to leaching become weaker in their structure. And so as we can see here, Salas Romero is one of these papers that does an integration between geophysical methods. Here we can see that the resistivity of the available layers there show some overlap, but should allow us to uh, make inferences between layers. And so I'm presenting ERT and TTEM, which are two separate electromagnetic methods where ERT directly puts a current into the ground and measures a voltage using electrodes. So the subsurface is basically used as a resistor in um, an electric circuit. Um, in comparison, TTEM uses a quad bike to tow one coil and another coil, the transmitter coil and the receiver coil which has a, a time varying field, which induces eddy currents in the subsurface, which induces secondary time varying field. So uh, what we basically wanna see is the difference between the primary field and the field that arrives. Uh, this is an image of everything that we did at the beginning of October. And we can see there's a lot of data that has been acquired. And the beautiful thing about the towed transient electromagnetic method is you can cover a whole lot of ground in a short amount of time. During the same time, we could only do three lines for ERT and one line for seismic. Um, if we focus here, there's bedrock outcrops, which will be very important. And of course, the landslide scar. Uh, we look at this from a slightly different angle to see results from a previous paper by Sean et al. 2014. These are the ERT lines and I will focus on one of the toad TEM lines, which is between these um, bedrock outcrops. In the previous work, we see this line two, where the bedrock Topography is delineated here. And when we compare that with the ERT line three here, in the preliminary results, we see a very similar topography for this high resistive structure. So I will keep the same color bar throughout. Um, we used gradient and dipole-dipole arrays. And with each of these results, we will see that the gradient inversion does a lot better than the dipole-dipole inversion. The RMS of this particular result is just below the allowed error for the album LS system that we've been using. And when we look at the lines here, we will next look at this cross line, which goes between the two outcrops, which crosses approximately here. And there we see that as we move away from the outcrop here, the resistor dips down. And as we move towards the next outcrop, it's not coming back up, which is quite interesting. Um, the dipole-dipole result here shows some very different results where it seems that if we have 
more conductive material, you can't really see below. And the same we is seen in the next one, where the RMS for the gradient is even quite poor. Um, this might be explained by this being very preliminary and we need more processing, but at the same time, it could also be because we're using a homogeneous initial model everywhere. And this is a very laterally varying subsurface. Um, next, I will show the results for TTEM, which are quite different. We can see here that TTEM has a very high resolution near the surface. And so there's a lot of resistivity structure that we can see um, in this when we move from the river towards the same part as where we are with ERT, but about 200 meters to the southeast. And then beyond this patch, a little bit more, this again could be the outcrop. Making a comparison between the two, taking this part here and blowing it up. So again, these are approximately parallel and there's 200 meters approximately between them with the ERT line two attaching to the outcrop. So here we see the outcrop dipping down and here the outcrop is not available, which means that this could be the outcrop further down. Um, as stated before, the ERT seems to have difficulty looking below a very conductive structure, which is a priori known from the method. And so one thing that would be extremely interesting is to make a joint inversion between these two methods that have been applied on the exact same lines of ERT, but we haven't gotten around to getting the results yet. So in conclusions, these are very preliminary results, which should improve with additional processing. The high resolution of TTEM at shallow surfaces together with the better resolution at depth for ERT complements very well. And integrating these two, joint inversion of these two together with all of the other geophysical methods uh, should aid the development of landslide mitigation strategies in the area. Um, we would all like to thank the SEG for supporting this particular camp. We got a, a quality grant from UU to also have non-geophysicists join to learn more about these important um, mechanisms. And that brings me to the end. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Alex. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, now uh, we are going to go to the questions, question time. I don't know if the audience has any question. Okay, so you have here a question. So Jonathan Dioro asks, did you perform join inversion or not? So um, for ERT, yes. Between the two methods, no. And the question, if it reduces uncertainties? Yes. Um, I think it's too preliminary to say. Uh, the results that I saw um, give RMS values that are approximately between the gradient and the dipole-dipole uh, results. Interestingly enough, for the line where we had poor gradient uh, RMS values, the RMS misfit of the joint inversion was worse than both, which indicates to me that it, it probably would be interesting to, to play around with that data set and um, see if a better initial model would help or if some of the 
the measurements are faulty that need to be changed. Okay, uh, so you will need more time to uh, understand and with the work in progress, you will also have another conclusions in the end. And maybe yes. that will be helpful, yes. Um, yes. What, what I do think though is that um, the close similarity between the previous work and um, the initial results for line three indicates that um, the results are already quite robust. The, the question is just like how much more accurate can we push it? Exactly. Um, actually, you have a suggestion here. Maybe you can do join inversion between ERT and TM. I definitely want to see that. Um, the thing is that both of them use resistivity. So it is one of the easier combinations to do a joint inversion. Um, the ERT uses a completely different way of sampling that. So we need to be careful with uh, frequency differences in the resistivity because um, the result you get is frequency dependent. So there might be a special relationship that we need to employ uh, to do that robustly. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for your talk and good luck to your work. Uh, hopefully you. we'll see some publication. Maybe I can ask a question still as well? Oh yeah, Jono, if you... Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, it's more of a general question, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that this uh, field work was conducted during the pandemic already? Yes. Yes, so uh, just in general, I, I feel like it's it's uh, an international uh, cooperation, if I understand it. So what were the specific challenges that uh, added to this, this field work to the pandemic? And how would you uh, actually, how did you actually deal with these uh, specific uh, issues? Do you have any examples of how it made it harder to do things and how you got around those issues? Um, firstly, the, the beginning, knowing if we were going to be able to do things or not was very difficult. We almost had to cancel the entire thing. Um, when we were doing anything, we had very big rooms with a lot of space in between people using masks, even though in Sweden uh, people are not recommended to wear masks. We did so anyways. Um, this includes presenting in a mask, which I cannot recommend. It's not a very nice thing to do. Um, the benefit that we did have is that this is a field camp. So it is much easier to be further away from each other and um, give people tasks that are further away from each other in the field. Um, We had hand sanitizer organized, we had masks organized. Like we had one person, Melanie, who was uh, preparing the entire pandemic security plan uh, beforehand, uh, which everybody adhered to during this. And um, we also know that nobody got sick during this time and after. Interesting, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Alex, once more. Uh, so if nobody has more questions. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, I will pass the lead to my colleagues, Jono and Florencia, so we can uh, go and start another session about seismic applications. Yes, hello everyone, I'm Florencia. Welcome to the session number two in Seismic Applications. Uh, I'm one of the chairs of this session and the other chair is gonna be Jano and I should like. So please tell me, uh, 
could you see my uh, screen? Actually? Yes. And we can. I suppose no, no uh, gray uh, commands. Okay, so uh, may I start? Yes, whenever you want, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so greetings, Jack Alex. My name is Alexander Shrifulin, and today I'm going to go to talk on the subject of the structured tensor in seismic tomography it, and its uh, case study with uh, Lake Baikal data. So first I'd like to bring uh, some introduction with, uh, with goal, tasks and a problem that I wanted to uh, explore in my study. Then uh, we'll consider theory of represented technique uh, for fast immigration velocity analysis for geologic settings will be discussed and after case study I'll bring analysis of results and sum up them all. So uh, let's start with the problem and it concerned with poor knowledge of the academic rich depth structure of Lake Baikal. Uh, so uh, and, and we need to use other technologies uh, either from the um, well, to understand it better. And the relevance was both in practical implementations of the, of the structure tender technology in seismic tomography and in a uh, scientific way to understand you uh, 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 uncertainties with Lake Baikal depth structure and P wave velocities of Baikal sediments. So hypothesis was in tomog that tomographic MVA with structured tensor uh, could produce uh, better focused and accurate depth images. And objective was in uh, building uh, depth uh, structure uh, of the academic reach with the new way in interpretation. And uh, I resolved uh, such tasks as combining experience of previous years, studying practical implementation of the method and uh, analysis of the results. So uh, let's start with the basics of theory. And um, uh, we know that uh, migration te technology exists in seismic and both uh, time and depth uh, variations uh, are implemented, but uh, only depth migrations could produce accurate depth images as it um, uses um, interval velocities in depth, uh, but the initial model uh, often is incorrect and we need to use uh, unflat events on the common image gazers to analyze them and to make uh, to use deviations from that in our velocity model. And reflection tomography actually could be used for that as we may uh, in involve in that process uh, ray path in our model and using linearization of Fermat's principle, uh, we can just resolve uh, the linear equation and to get uh, depth, uh, to get uh, velocities per perturbations uh, from the depth uh, deviations of RMOs. So structured tensors just could be used for the initi initialization of the uh, reflection reflectors on seismic image. Uh, it's actu it actually could be used for um, reflection grid uh, points. And you can see just uh, its matrix represented on that slide. It's a semi-definite positive uh, uh, matrix and the spectral decomposition could be used for the structure elements identification on seismic image. And formulas for that are provided on that slide. Actually for the um, uh, structure, uh, for the reflectors on the seismic image, we can use uh, first eigenvalue, uh, greatest eigenvalue which provides uh, our the um, value of gradients on uh, bright reflectors. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, we consider uh, Lake Baikal. Uh, it's um, uh, the deepest freshwater lake uh, and the third part uh, of the massive rip dome in the global Pacific Asian stress system. It is the rift system between Precambrian, Siberian, Craton, and several microplates of South Central Asia. 
and modern sediments are mostly represented by silt, clay material, um, um, the atomic uh, parts. Mostly there are no explicit boundaries in section according to drilling data from Lake Baikal Deep Drilling Project. And we will consider uh, seismic line 19 to 15 from the 1992 seismic experiment uh, with 117.5 kilometers length along the academic ridge and the northern part of Lake Baikal Basin. So you may see on that slide the initial data. Uh, they were represented by field gazers and navigation files. Also processing and acquisition reports were used for reprocessing with standard CDP data reprocessing graph, uh, including multiple elimination with SRME technology. And in the end, uh, that velocity model was created using uh, simple Dix uh, conversion. And here you may see uh, the depth section, seismic section with the overlaid initial uh, velocity model and with uh, RMOs, RMO values, which mostly tended to 7%. Uh, so the goal was to reach values between minus five and 5%. And now let's consider just two approaches. We'll start with classic grid based one with no constraints. And you may see Repair or latent seismic image on the regular grid. Uh, and uh, here represented uh, air modes. And it could be easily noticed that they become less than with the initial model. And you may see the result of the depth migration with our late updated model using two iterations of reflection tomography MVA. And now let's consider tensor constraint approach. And uh, it is obvious to see that uh, ray uh, reflects from the points on uh, reflectors and RMOs uh, become in general less than with the grid one approach. And what's important that we obtain such results uh, after only one iteration of tomographic MVA. On the picture, you may see also a result of the depth migration with updated uh, velocity model. So taking a hard look to uh, detailed uh, results, we may uh, notice that imaging in depth is better with tensor constraint model, which is seen on the picture with clinoform. Uh, also I emphasize it is only one iteration is needed to, uh, with structured tender technique. And what's interesting, the in thin layer subsurface and a small number of bright reflectors are not an obstacle for that approach. U uniform distribution of RMOs is quite interesting fact that we obtained uh, from uh, tensor technique, but there are actually no evidence neither for it's bad or it's good for uh, depth imaging. So the results uh, turned uh, to be more attractive than it maybe looks like. As you see, according to uh, drilling data, there is an interval in approximate 200 meters point uh, in the well BDP 98 between intervals with different sedimentation velocities. Also, entertaining fact that depth of the reflection horizons defined by Moore in 1997 are calculated from acoustic log estimated with linear regression using density log. So a tricky moment here, there are no stable boundaries defined for them in the core data. So the questions are, could we identify 200 meters boundary on seismic section? And uh, can we clarify depth values with new depth section? So uh, let's take a look at the depth seismic obtained with a model which uh, was updating, which updating is based on uh, the tensor constraint approach. And we may see that it is possible to identify 200 meters point on seismic image and to interpret corresponding reflection. Uh, major boundaries for seismic stratigraphy B10 and B6 also interpreted and new depth values discovered for them. Um, additionally, uh, area below mid volcano was observed and slide body and faults were highlighted on that uh, interpretation section. So moving on, I would like to look at obtained results as we see strong divergence between my value and previously estimated one with uh, density based acoustic log for B10 boundary exists. but. What's important really in that situation that we should uh, continue just explore that question as only 
accurate detailed analysis of login data and maybe more drilling I know may provide us the truth. Success is achieved actually for 200 meters boundary as it has strong stratigraphic context and we highlighted it on the seismic section. So let's sum up everything and I like to highlight the main research results as first reconvergence uh, with structured tensor-based migration velocity analysis. Also some optimization we have got in the process of our MVA and new techniques allowed us to get new data about the academic reach of Lake Baikal depth structure. But anyway, for better estimations, we need to continue our studies of such great lake and structure element of the earth crust. So uh, finally, I'd like to say thanks to SEG for organizing third virtual conference, which allowed me to represent my study. Also, Halliburton Company for size-based software in which uh, that technology is realized now. And Lomonos of Moscow State University and the Russian Academy of Science Institute of the Earth Physics for academic support and my research. So thank you for your attention. And I will just uh, ask any questions concerning my presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Alexander. Very interesting results. Um, please, if there is any question from the audience, uh, you can use the Q&A option or from any of the panelists. You're more than welcome to unmute your mics. Okay, in the meantime, I have a question. Uh, I would like to ask you more about the data that you use uh, because yeah. I uh, I didn't quite get it. like what type like uh, w what was the um, equipment that was used to acquire that data so, if you know because it's quite old. Yeah. Yes, so th this data are uh, provided by uh, United States Geological um, Survey and. Um, uh, it uh, was used um, one um, channel section uh, with uh, it was uh, used to a 96 streamer with uh, sorry 96 channel streamer uh, and uh, Balhash uh, ship for uh, these studies in 1992, and it was uh, experiment uh, common of our Russian Russian Academy of Science Institute of Oceanology and uh, American United States uh, Geologic Service. So these data uh, were used for my studies. Great. Um, we have. A question from Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, how much computational cost does this method reduce compared to the other tomographic method? What uh, could you do with that time money? Yes, actually this, um, this um, is the function of uh, what kind of data actually we use. So for two-dimensional examples, uh, it's quite uh, easy to compute and quite fast and robust process we've got um, because we just um, use only model uh, only two-dimensional model for our computations however for three-dimensional data I know like uh, some kind of a uh, three-dimensional seismic cube uh, with uh, 100 million traces um, of course um, the most um, um, uh, cost process uh, will be uh, depth migration, but uh, actual computation of the structure tensor uh, is co also quite robust, but will take uh, not uh, one minute, but uh, some kind of a 10 or 15 minutes that way. Good. Um... And uh, what program do you use to process the data? I, I think you said one from Halliburton? Yes, and uh, for the first studies of processing like uh, geometry initialization and um, 
uh, first uh, noise attenuation. I have used Radex Pro. It is Russian software for uh, processing of marine data. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think uh, if no one has any other questions, we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Yes, thanks to you. Yes, so um, our next speaker is Alexander Yablokov from Novosibirsk. Wait, I lost my yes, yes. State University, and he's going to be presenting a deep seismic reflection survey data processing by the new implementation of the method of multi-channel analysis of surface waves. So, Alexander, whenever you want. Hello, everyone. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, let's start. A study. Uh, I'm Alexander Yablokov. I'm a researcher in Novosibirsk State University, Novosibirsk Institute, and PhD student in Novosibirsk State University. And study object of my presentation is method, is new implementation of multi-channel analysis surface wave waves. Its uh, method uh, widely applied to investigate uh, subsurface structures for geotechnical purpose. And uh, he have several stages. Uh, first, it's uh, registration shot gathers, and then um, spectral analysis and extracting dispersion curves. And final step, it's inversion. It's mean estimation of S-wave profiles by measured dispersion curves. Uh, there are some problems um, in spectral analysis and inversion. Uh, first, it's uh, coherent and random noise lead to appearance of false energy maxima. Also, there are problems of interference of different modes of the surface wave. Uh, and it's important that uh, spectral analysis is performed manually uh, or semi-automatic and requires processor's experience. Uh, also, there are some problems in inversion. Now, local search methods uh, yield only smooth models, uh, and global search are, are computationally expensive. Uh, so, we proposed a new method for spectral analysis based on the Stockfull transform and new approach to inversion based on the artificial neural network. Uh, also, we tested our approach on serious synthetic big data and real data from the seismic exploration. Um, next to several slides, uh, I will give a summary of proposed um, algorithms and we will show results on synthetic and real data processing. Um, first, it is proposed uh, automatic spectral analysis by uh, Stockwell Transform uh, or just SFK method. Uh, let's uh, apply a uh, Sokol transform to each uh, receiver of the shot gases and we get uh, 3D dimensional by time, offsets and uh, frequency. If we uh, cut off by frequency time, uh, cut uh, by um, each frequency, we get a 2D complex variate function, which are all, which called teleseismograms and uh, Travel time curve uh, of surface wave packet uh, of the stable seismograms is a slanted line. And if we uh, describe, if we um, consider this function uh, taking uh, by computing uh, Fourier transform by X along all slopes uh, for all pseudo uh, seismograms, we get uh, this 1D complex valid function. Uh, then we uh, looking for maximum maxima um, for all growth velocities, and we get uh, standard uh, FK uh, image, and then we are uh, looking for maximum by um, wave number to um, picking dispersion curve. Uh, to demonstrate filtration properties uh, of proposed method, uh, let's uh, present the spectral processing results of the field data sets. Field data was obtained um, near Novosibirsk, uh, Russia, and uh, below uh, image uh, below uh, 
obtained by uh, left obtained by uh, proposed SFK method and uh, right uh, standard uh, FK transform. Uh, how we can see uh, that uh, image uh, obtained by uh, proposed method uh, uh, seems more clear than standard method. Uh, second uh, method which we propose it's uh, inversion algorithm uh, using by artificial uh, using artificial neural network or just an inversion. And um, proposed method consists several stages. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, observed all observed dispersion curves for our uh, study area, and we just average all this curve in one curve. Uh, and uh, we use this curve to estimate uh, possible, uh, possible model parameter ranges uh, using algorithm described, described in this paper. And then we using this range, we uh, pick it uh, uh, using uniform distribution, uh, pick it uh, models, uh, and then we, we use these models to calculate it uh, by numerically uh, dispersion curves mm. Bef because we uh, calculated is um, is uh, more time we use uh, polarization on CPU. Uh, we fitted uh, required architecture often uh, during research on the synthetic data and uh, in the final steps we train it our neural network using uh, these data sets and mm, we train it on neural network and safe weight. Uh, then we can uh, use uh, uh, safe weight uh, to uh, inverse uh, new data. And thus we obtain vectors of uh, S wave velocities uh, uh, and uh, sicknesses. Uh, this slide demonstrates experiment to study the accuracy uh, of proposed algorithm. We considered these models uh, to, to study accuracy, uh, synthetic models. Uh, and first, we compute uh, dispersion curves for each model. And then we estimate the possible model range, calculate uh, training and testing data sets. Finally, we training uh, neural network and performance inversion uh, for each model. Uh, then we can compute it, uh, the mean absolute error between uh, true as tested data sets and restored uh, data sets after inversion for VS for H sequences and build uh, its distribution. Uh, in addition, we have performed Monte Carlo inversion for comparison, and uh, we believe that. Ex expected value, value like uh, 8 meter per second for VS and uh, 0 0.8 for uh, thicknesses. It's, it is um, acceptable in practice uh, and it is much better than in, in Monte Carlo. Mm, also, mm, we see that INN inversion is more effective by computational times. Uh, now I will present field data processing, uh, data uh, gathered in West Siberia, Russia. Exploration area is about 1,000 uh, square kilometers. A data composed of 18,000 18, uh, seismograms. And uh, data are gathered for 2D uh, common depth point seismic inflection, sorry. And to process this data, we, we by analysis surface wave method, we can uh, we, mu we must um, uh, transfer uh, transfer uh, this uh, acquisition to single ended spread shot getters, and in the table the table shows acquisition parameters. Um, uh, and this is example of uh, data and uh, resulting uh, VS images. Uh, for both uh, for left, uh, right, for left uh, side of uh, source and right side source, right side and left side of source. And um, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, maximum offset is 500 meters uh, we use we used uh, we automatically uh, selected total about 55 uh, 35 uh, so, uh, thousand uh, phase velocity curves uh, and this figure shows uh, all observed dispersion curves and averaged uh, dispersion curve by blue line. Uh, we use this average dispersion curve to estimate uh, possible model parameter range uh, which we use to train our neural network. And now you see a result of inversion by artificial neural network uh, we reconstructed depth interfaces, uh, this uh, three images, and uh, velocities, uh, this, this uh, four Im images, uh, S-wave velocities. Uh, <clears throat> and we can compare these results with elevation map. Uh, the restored model parameters strongly correlate with altitude in terms of both layer depths and velocities. Uh, the study area is located in a uh, sporadic permafrost coverage zone. Uh, and based on our research results, we conclude that permafrost has uh, piecewise discontinuous characteristics. Characteristic, uh, the presence of permafrost uh, could be reason by why the velocity values uh, decrease uh, with depth. Uh, for example, uh, for this uh, area or this area, or this area. Uh, thus, uh, new approaches uh, to automatic picking dispersion curves and new approaches for is uh, inversion were proposed and uh, new approaches to spectral analysis based on S transform and uh, time frequency presentation of short gases and new approach for inversion based on application an artificial neural network, and it's an, it includes includes uh, data-driven estimating for the possible model parameter range, and accuracy of this of proposed um, inversion method is better than Monte Carlo method. Also, an inversion is faster than global search algorithm when processing large amounts of data. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. It's, it's the end of my presentation. Are there yes. any questions from Thank the you audience? very much. I have a quick uh, question myself. Um, for a neural network, from my understanding, um, you need lots of training data. And uh, one of the issues might be the, the fact that if you have lots of training data from a single case, it doesn't necessarily apply to a new case. So how do you uh, do? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with this? Um, we uh, we we can uh, we can have uh, not so much uh, observed data. We can use this in, for example, in engineering. Uh, we just uh, average. For example, we we have uh, ten. Uh, 10 dispersion, yes, of course. We can average it and uh, we use uh, average uh, curve for estimate, for estimate possible parameter range. And then we, we can use, um, we use um, synthetic models for these uh, ranges and calculated uh, synthetic uh, dispersion curves. Uh, we found that that um, acceptable uh, volume synthetic data sets for training, it's, it's, uh, it's this uh, okay. yes. numerical, yes. Uh, and after this, we train a neural network and then uh, we saved waves and we can uh, inversion our observed 10 dispersion curves. All right, thank you. And I also see a question from Alex. It says, nice presentation. Does your new method produce uncertainties uh, like you would get from the Monte Carlo? And uh, you have two minutes left, just uh, a heads up as well. Mm. Mm. I don't quite understand, understood the question. 
Uh, what about uncertainties in Monte Carlo? So I think, mm. uh, from my understanding of the Monte Carlo method, you get lots of models and you basically have an average model that is the, the most likely, but you have some uncertainty in there. And uh, how would how does that compare to your new method based on the ah. your algorithm? Mm, we we use uh, we use uh, we uh, application Monte Carlo for same uh, testing data set uh, like uh, which we use for inversion, and we use uh, the same training data set uh, like Monte Carlo kernel, um, and for we use training for. It is the same data for training uh, neural network. It's the same same data. Okay. Data mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we're moving on to the next session. So I would like to hand over and thank Florencia as well for the session lead and Alexander for his nice presentation. And then I would like to hand over uh, to okay. Catherine and to uh, Elizabeth for the third session of and final session of today. Okay, so we'll, uh, we're, we are about to start the third session, which is called Case Studies. And uh, for this session, chairs are uh, Elizabeth and myself. The first presentation will be from Anastasia Melich from Technical University of Ostrava. Is she here? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh... Okay, in just a second. Um, my name is Anastasia Melnik and uh, I'm a PhD student in uh, Technical University in Ostrava, Czech Republic. And now we have talked about potential field magnetic and gravity source uh, for depth analyzing and uh, construction 2D modeling geophysical data from the West Carpathian of the Flish Belt in Moravia. So uh, about the study area, it's very complicated because we have uh, two different um, uh, geological parts. Uh, first of all, is uh, this one is uh, uh, Bohemian Massif, what uh, which a part of West European Plate, and uh, this part is uh, uh, Western Carpathians uh, and. Uh, it's very complicated understanding uh, the difference, uh, the deep source of gravity and magnetic fields. Uh, so it's uh, the small part of my PhD work. Uh, I was, uh, uh, for me, it was goal to uh, to understanding what is the source for magnetic data, magnetic uh, fields, and for. Uh, uh, to interpretation, uh, I have used uh, the standards. It's uh, data analyzing, the analyzing of magnetic fields and gravity fields to take uh, quality interpretation. It's uh, a big part when I uh, con uh, constructions and creating a different uh, geophysical map, like first vertical duration, total magnetic derivations, 3D LR deconvolutions, or separating uh, the field uh, to uh, different parts. And uh, the second is uh, creating 2D modeling uh, in the profile uh, of seismic profiles to creating a new uh, physical geological models. Uh, so uh, the physical geophysical data, what was using is uh, on the left side is, uh, this is geomagnetic map of Delta T of, of study area. Uh, as you see, it's uh, very complicated, has a minimum, maximum, and uh, very, very uh, difficult to understand it, what was for the regional data and where what was the small source of the of this uh, uh, magnetic anomalies and the 
right side you can see the map of complete burger anomalies reductions density for 2.67 kilograms now meter squares and uh, first part for me was uh, to take uh, Spectra analyzes uh, the, gravit uh, the grid, uh, the grid uh, data to see uh, what was uh, the source from the deep, what from the uh, small source. And on the left side, uh, you can see the graph. Uh, like this one, it's uh, the source of deep, uh, deep source and another on the small what was on the surface so uh, and uh, you can see the like uh, the deep source uh, was on the 10 kilometers uh, depth and the small source approximately from zero to maximum one kilometers uh, depth and the similar uh, picture you can see on the right side it's a uh, it's a spectrum, uh, power spectrum from gravity data. Uh, they have uh, the deep source, the middle, some part, and the uh, surface. Uh, 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 one more. The power spectrum uh, use, uh, use uh, to sorry uh, to separate uh, to separate data. Uh, uh, the separating the potential field into a deep uh, from shallow sources. Um, second part was creating uh, on the left side the uh, first vertical deriva uh, derivative. Uh, it uh, usually it's always good to create into for locations, structures, and ages for gravity. Uh, for gravity uh, and uh, the right side uh, you can see uh, total uh, horizontal derivative uh, uh, they usually use uh, to see the contact um, uh, with different uh, uh, different source of gravity uh, density or substitutability so uh, from the, this is from magnetic data, and as you can see, the Bohemian Massif is uh, can uh, show the quiet field, and the Western Carpathian have a uh, many small source of uh, magnetic uh, uh, magnetic anomalies, and the same uh, you can see on the total horizontal derivative. Uh, this map was created from gravity data. Uh, as you can see, you have uh, see the contact uh, before the Bohemian Massif and Vester Carpathian. Um, for uh, qualitative interpretation, I was used uh, two seismic uh, profiles. What was uh, measurement in, uh, in 1985, 86. Uh, uh, so the second map was uh, uh, them creating 3D evolved deconvolutions. Uh, it was using useful for me, very because uh, uh, I can uh, create in the map and for different uh, geological structures, calculate uh, where can be the source of magnetic anomalies and gravity and to see uh, if it will be uh, correlate with uh, uh, the physical geological models uh, with seismic profiles, so what uh, we have. So uh, the most important in uh, this picture is uh, this part, when you see the uh, small source, of magnetic anomalies and uh, their uh, depth. So we can see the this part. Uh, they like uh, it's uh, like increase it. Here you can see this uh, some part. Uh, this is a source, and these two, these two anomalies. It means that uh, some uh, 
some bodies have a different magnetic field. On the, uh, the second uh, lines of dipoles, uh, the different structural index, uh, we can see that uh, doesn't have uh, some anomalies, so some sources. So uh, most of this, uh, most uh, of this area is uh, the structural index source was type of prism. And uh, first of all, uh, the last and uh, more important uh, to uh, create uh, from the uh, uh, from seismic profiles, uh, physical geological models. And uh, as we see on the last uh, map, uh, the small sources is correlate like here's the anomaly and here's the body of the, this magnetic anomaly sources. So it's uh, and uh, their depth was correlated from the map. So uh, this, that's why the quality interpretations, uh, the creating different map to, uh, to take the more information is uh, so important to take the something new information. Uh, this is the first profiles and uh, with, and this is the second. Uh, this uh, with correlate when with one uh, adept bore hole what we have on this area and uh, the magnetic anomalies uh, was uh, correlate with uh, different mag with different formations uh, in uh, uh, in upper uh, carboniferous uh, And this is all. <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, do you have any questions? No. If now I have uh, two questions. First of all, in Romania, uh, raw gravimetric data is classified. Is the same in Czech Republic? Uh, the old data was uh, from a uh, geological survey. I just uh, uh, take the uh, text file and creating in uh, a special software. It's Oasis Monte from Geosoft, uh, creating the grid with, uh, uh, with steps 20, uh, 250 uh, meters to creating the, around the grid and creating from this grid to creating the other maps. Okay, so basically you had access to the raw data? Yes. Okay, and the one more question, can we go to the last slide, please? Please. Yeah, uh, that one. Uh, in the right side, uh, you can see that the gravity on, the, on that profile increases in the lower part. But it says D equals 2,700. No, uh, go lower, please. In the uh, crystal basement, it looks like the gravity is higher, but on your graph, it shows that it's smaller. Yes, the basement was uh, goes up, but uh, because they have the low of Miocene, uh, uh, it's uh, very low uh, density. Because here you can see the uh, uh, Carboniferous, the uh, Coulomb belt, have uh, mm -hmm. usually. Um, the density uh, 2.65, 69 to 2.72, like uh, like here. Uh, but is uh, in this part the miocene have just uh, 2.0 uh, the density. That's why this uh, part is was go to low. So basically, it's the combinative effect of the two parts, right? Yes. Okay, and I have one question from Elizabeth. Uh, do we know the bodies producing the anomalies? Are they potential or bodies? In slide number nine, she said. Um, uh, I'm just slide number it. nine. Okay, I doesn't see. Can you repeat? So, uh, Elizabeth asked, do we know the bodies producing the anomalies? Are they potential or bodies? Um, in this area, in the mag uh, magnetic field, it's very complicated because uh, they have uh, the hydrocarbon resources is, and uh, not so many studies about all magnetic uh, sources. 
So uh, just, uh, I think 50 or 60% was uh, uh, the confirmed that it was the potential field. But the, the last one, the 40% was uh, do not confirm. And uh, in my studies, it was the most opinion uh, to, uh, to take, uh, uh, understand it if it all was uh, uh, complete. And now I'm working on the Car Western Carpathian on this part. And uh, it was confirmed that yes, uh, the most of them are a magnetic uh, potential field, just magnetic bodies. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? No, so we can go to the next presenter. Uh, Elizabeth, can you help me with this one? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Anastasia. And now we move on with the second presentation, uh, which is from Giuseppe Ferrari from University of Naples, Federico II. And he's presenting Electromagnetic Investigations, FDEM, at the Heron site, mouth of Seller River. Welcome, Giuseppe. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. I don't know if you hear me. Yes, it's good. Yes, um, I, I present my work, uh, my thesis, uh, bachelor degree work. Yes, so um, I'm Giuseppe Ferrara, a master's student in geology, the geophysical uh, course of study at the University of Naples, Federico II, uh, in Italy. And I'm also the treasurer of the SEG student chapter of Naples. And today I will show you the work of my bachelor degree thesis about electromagnetic uh, magnetic investigation uh, at the Arion site, the famous archaeological site near Pescum, at the mouth of the Sailor River in southern Italy. This area represents an old Greek religious zone, and it has been studied by archaeologists and geophysicists with the aim to find any buried structures through the investigation of uh, electrical conductivity and magnetic susceptibility parameters. The expected targets uh, were mainly a strategic road that connected the site to central area of Pestum, uh, Valley of Temples, showed in, uh, here in photo. Some other structures around the temple of uh, Hera Argiva and a boat landing structure which caused the mouth of Sail River. The site is localized inside an alluvial plain called the Sele Plain, in which there are different lithologies such as uh, fluvial, uh, marshy deposit, and traverse units which represent, therefore, the barring materials. The goal of the project is the study of the area uh, with an unconventional geophysical method, and no standard method that we use to analyze an archaeological site, frequency domain electromagnetism, or FDM, which belongs to low frequencies electromagnetic uh, method. The FDM is based on the generation through a transmitting coil, T, of a primary electromagnetic field, which induces a circulation of current in the soil, which in turn generates an electromagnetic field called the secondary uh, at fixed frequency, whose intensity is proportional to electrical conductivity of medium crust. The parameters uh, that are described in the action of FTM method is a neutral number, theta, which depends on a wavelength, conductivity, magnetic susceptibility, and distance between sensors. Here I'm showing the investigated uh, area from Google Earth, uh, where the red lines are the prospection of 13 grids that I um, uh, used. In particular, there are the different dimensions of grid in two different zones of the site. The first is uh, far from uh, Sailor River and near to Temple of Argila that is on the left, while the second one goes to the mouth of Sailor River uh, that is on the right, and the space uh, between the profile is uh, one meter. The, the electromagnetic investigation uh, at the reference site were carried out with the profiler EMP400, which operates in the frequency domain. The measurements were made uh, with a vertical arrangement uh, orientation of the di dipoles. The profiler is a multi-frequency electromagnetic induction instrument from 1,000 to 60,000 Hz, used uh, simultaneously 1,000, 10,000, and 50,000 Hz. From the secondary electromagnetic field, we measure two components, the phase quadrature component, or Q, proportional to the phase shift between the transmitted and the received waves, and which is proportional to a quantity of the investigated subsoil volume defined the apparent conductivity. 
Um, this last is, however, realistic only for an homogeneous medium, while the in-phase component, the second component, or I component, is a proportion of to the intensity of received uh, electromagnetic field, which is an index of uh, metallic presence uh, since they greatly amplify the subsoil response in terms of magnetic uh, susceptibility. The detecting signal by the receiving coils is represented by the vector sum or from the resultant of the primary magnetic field and of the secondary induced magnetic field. It oscillates with the same frequency as the primary. Specifically, in phase component is the real component, and quadratic component is the imaginary component. Experiments are expressed in part per million. The in phase component or I component depends on the uh, K, that is a magnetic susceptibility while Q components is almost the same in the, all the range of theta induction number. Considering an homogeneous medium, but for low values of K and high values of induction number, the I component is similar to Q components, and we consider a pure resistive meter medium, while a more interesting scenario occurs if the susceptibility has high values, while induction number uh, is uh, low. With the uh, I components is different from Q components. In this case, the I components map indicates a poor magnetometer due to susceptibility values, while Q components map indicated a resistivity with information about conductivity. So we analyzed the first area, uh, zone A, uh, with the dimension 25 per 50 meters, the direction of acquisition data to the north. Zone A uh, is located between two archaeological sites that are already excavated. The result of the acquisition uh, with a component in phase map at 50,000 Hz uh, had to be processed with the Krieging interpolation um, and the use of DWT, the very spread wavelength transform, which represents a multi-resolution multi uh, analysis to separate high and low frequencies content, which is low uh, as a direction of filtering and uh, for decreasing linear noise. Later, the map is interpreted and identifying uh, some interesting point in lineation which are compared with the result of uh, other methods, like, uh, like uh, magnetometer or uh, GPR. These boxes uh, on the left, on the right, indicate some parts of map which are characterized by conductivity and resistivity, while the point to the left may be show a buried uh, metal object. So in red, uh, um, uh, you can see the investigated area on which we overlie the result of a georeferencing map and how both uh, the in-phase map and in-quadrature phase map are similar. But uh, um, the second analyzed area is a zone C, it's uh, composed by two grids, and it's located on the left of the archaeological excavation. And in this case, we can see how the two maps are different. In fact, if we assume a typical conductivity value of uh, an aluminal plane, uh, such as uh, 1,200 1, seconds on meter, uh, I component is different from Q component, showing uh, some interesting parts. The first box starting from the top of the component in phase map is an anomalous uh, lineation of a magnetic uh, susceptibility, while in the middle of the map, uh, the signal of a magnetic susceptibility is saturated by the presence of little tracks um, like this. Um, little tracks uh, that archaeology used to transport out uh, excavated soil. The iron of these tracks has uh, an eye conductivity that we um, uh, show uh, also in the quadrature phase map. In this case, we can compare the resulting of these two different uh, uh, interpretative maps, uh, um, uh, like uh, in phase quadrant, in phase component, and quadrature component. In the second area, uh, here, a, um, here a, a zone uh, with the, its L form is composed by two grid, the dimension of eight uh, for uh, 44 and 10 for 20. It's located between uh, the archaeological excavation near mouth of Silly River. Also in this case, uh, these two maps are different. We can in fact identify magnetic anomalies in the phase component map, such as the first box uh, from the bottom and the first uh, on the left. Maybe iron buried object. There is also an evident linear anomal anomaly, which is not present in the quadrature phase map. And there are also at the top of the map an interesting maximum and minimum anomalies. So in red, you can see the investigated area on which we uh, overlie the result of in phase component interpreted it, and the two component uh, interpreted it, and analyze the differences. 
However, uh, we can compare as for zona C1 plus C2 the map of a vertical gradient of a magnetic field, a conventional method used for archaeologic investigation from another work, with the component in phase map 50,000 50, Hz of FPM. In this case, in fact, almost all the magnetic anomaly um, uh, in, this, in the first map correspond to the anomaly with the higher susceptibility in the FPM map. In fact, uh, in the in-phase component is a good indicator, in this case, of a buried uh, magnetized, magnetized uh, bodies. The lineation at the top, present uh, in both of the map, uh, is very interesting, uh, which runs along on the left uh, excavation, uh, already carried out, carried out uh, and which show the remains of an ancient house. As a regard for zone A, it's, it has been compared a GPR time slice, a history the vertical gradient map of magnetic field, and a component in phase map at 50,000 Earth of FPM. And in this case, it was verified that the in phase component of the FPM is more associated with the GPR time slice than the vertical gradient of a magnetic field map. Uh, with the evidence of a buried metal object on the left um, of the map uh, and some lineation following um, and symmetrical trend. This time uh, with the high conductivity, while uh, uh, in the vertical gradient map uh, of the magnetic field, there aren't uh, any particular interesting trend uh, or uh, anomaly. At the end uh, um, of the comparison for the zone uh, RA between the vertical gradient map of magnetic field and component in this map at 50,000 Hz, perhaps the most interesting from an archaeological point of view, because uh, these two maps are very similar, starting from a magnetic, magnetic anomaly with the high susceptibility at the bottom, continuing through that interesting linear anomaly uh, present in both of maps, and which uh, tends to join the two excavation areas on the side of the surveyed map, ending in the upper part where there are two strong anomalies, probably related to metal objects. So in conclusion, we can uh, characterize subsoil in function of their magnetic susceptibility and electric uh, conductivity when I component is different from two component and there are high values of susceptibility and low values of induction number. We can also improve the support on the, the use of FDM for future, future archaeological activities by identifying buried anthropogenic uh, structure. We must emphasize the importance of achieving the full data in archaeological excavation and the advantage of a multi-methodological geophysical investigation. Thanks for uh, your attention. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask if you know the average depth of um, the structures that yes. you managed to map. The depth, uh, the depth uh, depends uh, by many factors like uh, distance between sensor that is uh, uh, 18 uh, centimeter. Um, depends on the skin depth, it depends on the type of frequency. In this case, uh, the mm -hmm. depth is uh, one meter and a half, um, maximum two meter of depth. Mm -hmm. uh, are you planning to uh, start an archeological excavation at the site for these structures? Yes, the, the, the archaeologists uh, yet PCR, yet PCR cannot uh, um, program uh, the uh, field uh, um, archaeological excavation for COVID-19. Uh, but the next year, this, um, this map uh, of zone hair hay, is, um, majorly this lineation, but also this map, uh, this map uh, where, um, where uh, in, in important to, um, to the next exhibition or the next year. Yes, it's understandable. So are there more questions? Yes, I this one from I'm... oh sorry. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> there is one question from Alex Obe. He says, thank you for your presentation. In a multi-method investigation for such sites, is there a particular order of methods which you could use to identify the targets? Yes, yes. Um, the first two methods that, uh, is already, uh, that are already present uh, in an archaeological establishment are a GPR method or a magnetometric method. The aim of this study is that also the FDM method can be used in support of these two methods. Because uh, in um, some circumstances, 
this uh, this method can be um, useful and uh, we um, information and we can give us uh, some information about the DPR and the future with the vertical gradient magnetic. But uh, the first two methods that we use uh, are GPR and uh, magnetic. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And now, I am sorry. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question? Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask you, um, I see that uh, the direction of the investigation is uh, uh, parallel, let's say, if you go a few slides up. Yes, uh, so um, uh, why you decided to do it like that and not uh, vertically? It depends on the target. Yes, yes, because uh, in this case, uh, for example, uh, the direction of the, um, uh, the wall of uh, this ancient house are up to the north. So we uh, use this direction to uh, take the wall in a particular way. Okay. Also, in this case, also in this case, the direction of this wall are to the north and uh, with um, this, uh, like, um, this acquisition, we can find the, the, the wall in the, in the um, perpendicular way, like in this case, and for, with the desalination. Okay. And one more question. Um, you said that this machine, um, of course, it has different range of frequencies, but of course, the frequency, if it's high, it's for, uh, uh, for the lower. Um, uh, target, let's say. Uh, so, what is the specific frequency that you use for this target? Because you said that is about 0 0.8 centimeters or so. Yes. No, I use the simultaneously three frequencies: 1,000, 1,000, and 50,000. At the same time, okay. But only 50,000 hertz frequency will uh, give me a good result, a better result, because it's a um, measure resolution. It has a high resolution. Okay. okay, thank you so much for your replies. Okay, and now moving on to the last presentation. Catalin? Okay, or... okay uh, our last presentation will be from uh, Kazakov Andrei Dimitrievich. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Just a minute. <clears throat> so, uh, good afternoon, dear participants of the conference. Uh, I want to say that I'm really very glad to hear all of you. My name is Andrew Kazako, and I'm a fourth-year student of Gupkin, Russian State University of Oil and Gas. Um, also, I represent my friend and colleague Nikita from uh, the from same academy, uh, who is co-author for this work. He's here with me. First of all, we want to uh, to say thank for organizers uh, for giving us the opportunity to present this report at such serious event. This report is devoted to SHD method of development. This method is relevant for highly viscous oil. This slide provides the content, content of the report. During preparing it, we analyzed scientific articles and open sources. I'd like to start with uncon unconventional oil classification. Then we will analyze highly viscous oil distribution, SHD method, cluster analysis of the data, and increasing of development uh, productivity. First, uh, a few words about contacts. It's not a secret um, that uh, the resources of traditional hydrocarbon uh, resources are depleted. So the issues of the production of unconventional hydrocarbons are becoming increasingly, increasingly important. As for oil, 
its unconventional nature can be described either by the properties of the rock or by the oil properties. Among oils that are unconventional in terms of their characteristics, heavy and super heavy oils are an important category. Uh, they will be the focus. By definition, these are hydrocarbons of high, high density and viscosity that require thermal, chemical or electrostatic impact on the source rock in order to extract liquid fractions. So, according to the geographical distribution, the male world uh, reserves of heavy oil are located in South America, mostly in Venezuela, and the second largest region in terms of its reserves is Eurasia. Here is a distribution of highly viscous oil in Eurasia. Russia accounts for 75% of Eurasia highly viscosity oil. Uh, so, uh, a few words about the SHD methods. The SHD methods um, or steam assisted gravity drainage is one of the most common methods for extracting such raw materials. Its essence lies in the fact that two parallel horizontal wells are drilled, one of which is four or six meters higher than the other. The up well is used to inject steam into the formation and create a high temperature steam chamber. The lower one is used to produce a heated mixture of oil and water. And um, here is an analysis of a uh, dynamic data of 168 pairs of SHD employed wells in China, uh, Fenchen, three typical models of development. Um, they were created using cluster uh, analysis. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, these models differ by level of heating and temperature mode. Uh, now let's analyze three models of uh, SHD. Uh, so, so model uh, number one is a steady development of horizontal well. Temperature difference on horizontal part is rather small and development is uh, rel uh, relatively equal both on hill and tor. For model number two, unsteady development of horizontal well, temperature difference on horizontal part is rather small. And for model number three is low uh, level of development of horizontal part, but very big temperature difference on horizontal part. Uh, so, uh, so here is a data of model uh, number one. You can see that uh, you can see that maximum maximum temperature on production well is either near hill or true, and uh, temperature difference on horizontal part is rather small, uh, and development is steady. For number uh, for model number two. Uh, maximum temperature is near hill and high initial level of inclusion of horizontal part in development. Uh, in development, yes. And um, uh, here you can see data uh, of uh, model number three. Now, <clears throat> now let's analyze increasing development uh, productivity. Uh, so, uh, for model number one, with a steady development of horizontal well, it's a lowering of subcool parameter of space between wells. For model number two, it's in steady development of horizontal part. And, uh, for, uh, um, and for this model is a relevant additional electric heating. And for model number three, uh, uh, with bad development of horizontal part, it's a secondary heating or auxiliary steam injection into uh, in vertical well. Uh, so, and in, in conclusion, I'd like to say uh, that, as we can see, uh, oil recovery with, with SHD is not mm, uh, very uh, effective and sometimes additional means uh, are necessary for good production. Uh, but the future of oil industry belongs to uh, unconventional resources, so this method is quite uh, relevant. And uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. 
Thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, do you have any questions? If not, I have one question. Uh, can you tell us uh, how much the production was increased in some of those wells? Okay. Um, can, can you can you repeat, please, the bad internet connection? Can you tell us how much the production was increased in those wells after you applied this uh, uh, this uh, SAGD method? Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to say that actually we um, actually we don't uh, we don't have any data about uh, the uh, increasing of production because we concentrate of uh, uh, we concentrate on this uh, on these models and on the ways of um, it's increasing. What? No. Uh, uh, my colleague would like to say about it. Okay. Can you say, please? Uh, yes, hello. I am uh, <laughs> Nikita. I want to say that in this work, we only propose uh, the, the principal, uh, the, the principal ways for increasing production. Uh, but uh, we actually don't know uh, how it would uh, affect uh, the numbers. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? There's a question in the chat. Just a minute. One second. Uh, I don't think there is any question in the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat either. So I think this is it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all. And I uh, would like to make some closing remarks. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to thank all the speakers of today. I think you all gave very interesting uh, presentations. I feel like I learned some things, but that's always good in, a, in such an afternoon. So thank you. And I hope you uh, all feel that you got valuable feedback and that you uh, like um, like what you heard uh, with regards to questions and stuff today. Uh, secondly, I would like to uh, uh, thank all the audience uh, today. I think uh, you've been a good audience. I, uh, I'm glad that you had some questions uh, to ask the presenters and I hope you, just like me, learned something today. Um, then I would also like all the session chairs and the organizing committee, of course, for all their input and for the for all their assistance and help that they did with organizing this um, uh, event. I would specifically like to thank uh, Ophelia and Aurelian and of course Laurie, uh, Laurie for all, uh, all of her organizing. Then um, if you saw this um, conference and you were inspired and you would might want to help and uh, you are asking yourself how can I help but if you are an SEG member you can contact Lori and uh, we are still looking for people that are willing and able to help with our uh, sometime next year so you can contact Lori and she can um, if you are an SEG member she can uh, invite you to, to the committee and that would allow for you to um, Ah, in May 2021, I see that the fourth uh, virtual student conference is. And of course, if you don't want to help, but you do want to be attending or you even want to present again, then uh, that would be very welcome as well. Uh, finally, there was one more thing. Um, next week, the SEG Near Surface uh, Geophysics uh, Division has a pub club in which they will uh, discuss uh, one of the geophysics papers. 
So if you are interested, you can uh, Google for more information on that or Laurie might put some in the chat and you can, um, ah, you can ask Laurie or anyone else uh, for more information on that. And with that, I would once again like to thank everyone for attending today, for presenting today, for organizing today and uh, have a nice evening. <laughs>